Welcome to the Global Missions Inc. podcast. This episode features Mervyn Sunbo. I believe God has a purpose in his divine plan for families from the beginning of creation. It's a powerful and it's a unique organism. It'll one day fill the entire earth. We're building strong families, not only for the here and now. We are building for the generations to follow. It may be useful at the very onset to define the pattern that God has in mind for the family unit. In it, and in doing so, I will quote a bit from an article that Brother Alan Hinchliffe wrote titled, The Kingdom of God, and it's in his big, thick book. I think it's called Building God's House, if I'm not mistaken. I sometimes get the mixed up. But it's that, it's one of, it's, it's in there. And this is what he says. God has established examples of his kingdom. A family that is established according to the order of God is an example of the kingdom of God. The man is the head of the family. His wife is given to him by God as a, as his helper. And the children are the subjects of that little kingdom. They all walk together in submission to the plan and will of God. This is a beautiful order. And it, and if it is followed, God's blessing will rest upon the members of that unit. Now let me be clear. When this order gets mixed up, when it gets reversed, or in somehow mixed, somehow mixed up, the result is disorder. This is not, let me make this clear, this is not a superior, subordinate relationship between husband and wife. It is not that. It is an equal relationship. But the roles and responsibilities of the two people involved are different. And they have been laid down and set down by God. If you want to argue with it, then you argue with God. And see how you do with that. Tremendous responsibility lies on the father and mother of every family to rear, to rear their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's found in Ephesians 6, 4. <clears throat> this is a task that requires much prayer on beha- behalf of mother and father. Much prayer. Seeking the Lord's wisdom in rearing their children in an environment that I would suggest to you is often hostile. It is often contrary to Christian principles. The influence of the secular world is vast. Worldly values and philosophies come upon our children in many different ways, from many different sources. The enemy knows that his defeat lies in unity and peace in the church, and his victory lies in creating division and dissension among God's people. It's far better for the Christian family to have a positive 
godly influence on our fellow Christians, on our families, on our colleagues, on our relatives, than to let them have an ungodly influence on us. I don't know who said this. You know, I jot things down and I don't put the author sometimes, and then I can't find the author. You ever have that happen? But anyway, somewhere along the line, I jotted this down. That the saddest thing in all the world is to see the church walking with the world. In other words, you can't tell the difference. That's a sad thing. The bride of Christ walking with the world. Society should not dictate the morals and values that should be part of our lives. But rather the word of God should be our guide, which will run contrary to the thinking, conversation, and conduct of this world. Here again I come to another quote. And I don't know who said it. But I believe it. Whoever said it, said it, put it this way. Worldliness is whatever makes sin look normal and righteousness look strange. Well, you think about that for a minute. And you think about the world that you come from, maybe the world that you work in, maybe where you find yourself from time to time, and you are going to find that that is a pretty accurate description of society today. In fact, Isaiah had it pretty well right on the money when he said in the fifth chapter, the 20th verse to the 21st verse, Woe to those who call good evil. Who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. You ever got... Tangled in being wise in your own eyes? I'm sure we all have. We found out last night that there's a place where you can have great, uh, a true wisdom. And that is, you ask of God, who gives liberally. He doesn't dole it out just little, little bit pieces at a time. He gives liberally to those who are sincere, sincere and those that ask. He's not like me when I was a child and my cousin would ask me, I was eating a chocolate bar. My father run a grocery store and I, I've eaten so many chocolate bars that I, I don't eat one anymore. <laughs> he wanted a piece. So I'd break off the smallest little piece I could break off. Because I wanted it all for myself. God's not like that. I was a child. Thank goodness I wasn't an adult. So this is where we are today in our society. What was once acceptable was, or I should say, put it the other way, what was once unacceptable is now acceptable. I could name things, but I don't want to get caught up in that. You understand that. You understand what we once, what, 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 what in society was acceptable and uh, unacceptable and now has become acceptable. Uh, the, the majority have, have, they believe that. The majority are, are on, on, on track with that. We don't have to be. Do we? We don't have to follow the majority. As my wife used to say, or dad used to tell her, just because everybody's doing it, you don't have to. 
I can well hear him saying that. The laws of God have not changed. The Ten Commandments were written on the tablets of stone by the finger of God. You know, I wonder if we don't get that expression. You know, this is etched in stone. Or this is not etched in stone, meaning it's kind of flexible. I think maybe that's where that expression comes from. I don't know that. Do you know that, Brian? I, I'd like, I think maybe we could do a little research on that. Because it seems like that's where it could have come from. There's no changing them. They are as permanent... Today is when they were written. Man-made laws today are eroding and chipping away at the laws of God. Then in Romans 12, 2, we read this. And do, and do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, that word transformed has bothered me a a lot. I'd like to know more about that word. I'd like to know know more about how how that comes about. And you know, in the natural, uh, one of the greatest transformations that you can maybe think about, uh, some of you scientists may know of others that are, are equal or better, but the, 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 the transformation from the caterpillar to the butterfly is pretty, pretty significant. When you think about what was crawling on the, on the ground, and, and, and I guess claw, he can crawl up trees and he can, and he can eat and eat and eat. And that thing, that insect, that organism, I don't know what you call it, is not, is not very desirable, uh, in, in most ways. I, I, I don't think they're very desirable. But they become butterflies. There, Brian can explain that a lot better than I can. And I've heard him explain it. And, uh, it, it's something that is so, it, it's so fantastic. It's so dramatic. It changes the whole characteristic of that, that, that insect, that thing. It changes it completely. Once it was crawling on the ground, now it's flying in the air. Once it was kind of a detestable looking thing, now it's a thing of beauty. You know something? I think God has that in mind for us. He's got a transformation, something like that in mind for us. He wants he wants this flesh of mine. Uh, you know, if there's one thing I get tired of, do I come soon now? <laughs> Better stay here. He wants this flesh of mine to disappear. The kingdom of God is not eat and drink. What is it? It is righteousness, peace. And joy. He wants to consume. You know, our God is a burning fire. You know what fire does? It burns away. You know, the fire was a friend to the three Hebrew children. Children it was a real friend. Because they went in bound and they come out loosed. And so all that fire did to them was just burn the bonds off their, their hands and their feet. You know, sometimes the things that we face might seem tough, might seem difficult to go through, but you know, it might be the very thing we need to burn away some of our flesh. Hallelujah. Which troubles us all. I think I can say that with some, with some authority because I think that I have and am experiencing it. Be not conformed. You know what conformed is. 
It's, it's, it's acting like, it's doing like, it's thinking like, it's speaking like the world. Be not conformed. But be transformed, be changed from the caterpillar to the butterfly. Be changed, how? By the renewing of your mind. Do you know what? Oh, I think he's telling me not to do this. Do you know what? Do you know what the renewed mind is? That's right, Marjorie. I read your lips. I can't hear very well. Well, I'm getting better and better at lip reading. The mind of Christ. What mind would you sooner have? You like your own? Well, then have fun with it. Because it'll lead you down the garden path. It'll lead you places where you don't want to go. I can speak first. You prove it. <laughs> he says, I'm proving I can't stay put. Or I can. I can. Okay. I'll be good. What a transformation. What, what a change from the fleshly mind to the mind of Christ. I want you to listen to this, to this quote. You have probably heard of or read uh, The Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm by Philip Keller. In that book, he says this. Listen to this. Here again, the only possible practical path to attaining such a mind, free of the world's contamination is to be conscious daily, hourly, of the purging presence of God's Holy Spirit, applying himself to my mind. Boy, he said a mouthful there. That is the way. That is how we're changed. You can't change your mind. You can't, you can't enter into the spirit in the way you want to by, by, uh, by yourself. The spirit must give you the ability to change and to do what he wants you to do. You are powerless in your own flesh. Now maybe I've digressed a little bit. From the family. But you know, sometimes we do that. I've often quoted, right in this building, from Deuteronomy 30, 19 and 20. For I have set before you life and death. I believe that this is true today. He set before us life and death. Blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Those people that are, are, are connected to me, you stand up. No, I'm connected to you all spiritually, but I'm connected to these in the flesh. And I want you to know that Grandpa and Grandpa, Grandma and Grandpa, have chosen them, have chosen life for them. If there's something that I don't... uh, uh, You'll forget most of what I say this morning. But there may be something that you won't. And while they are still standing, I want to say this. There very seldom is a day that goes by that I don't claim them for Christ. I shouldn't say I. I should say we. Because 
Grandma does the same thing. We claim them for Christ. You should claim your grandchildren for Christ. You should claim your children for Christ. You should claim all of those that are going to follow in the next generation and the next and the next and the next for Christ. They do not belong to the world. They do not belong to the enemy. I don't care how difficult the circumstances look in a particular uh, situation. You say, what? oh, you don't know. You don't know about our situation. He is able for every situation. Claim them. Claim them for Christ. Mela, Leah, you can't get away. You're claimed for Christ. You can sit down. <clears throat> now, that scripture goes on to say, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, And that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days. Wow. He is your life and the length of your days. That scripture has a lot to do and a lot to say about the family. For we see that father and mother who choose life not only choose it for themselves, but they choose it for their children, for their grandchildren, and the generations that will follow them. This is not mythology. This is a promise of which there are many genealogies of families in which the Holy Seed has been preserved. Andrew Murray, in his book, How to Raise Children for Christ, enumerates one instance where a family by the name of Fisk began their Christian walk in England and emigrated to the United States and were followed for generations. Here is one quote from that account. In 1857, 300 of the descendants of this praying mother were members of Christian churches. 300 people. 300 members. It flowed down through the generations. I know that there are people right in this audience today that could come up here and testify the same thing that they had seen the Holy Seed preserved, hallelujah, from generation to generation. It can be the same for all of us. The scripture instructs us to choose life. For the generations that will follow us. There will be people added to your families. Through marriage. Through uh, perhaps adoption. Or in many ways your family will become extended. They'll need your prayers. They'll need to be claimed for Christ. Christ. Because they belong to him. Because they're part of you. And we're part of each other. They do not belong to the world. They do not belong to the enemy. They belong to Christ. Just as the lamb was slain for each member of, for each uh, household at the time of the tenth plague. In Egypt. So the Lamb of God was slain for each uh, member of our households. Our protection is in the shed blood of Christ. 
Never give up on claiming them for Christ, regardless of how impossible a particular situation may look. God's God's specialty is in making the impossible possible. Let us take a moment. I think I still have a little time. Let us take a moment and consider the account of the prodigal son. We have heard about it already here last night. And a little different take on it. And that's fine. Today, I'd like to take a moment and and focus on the attitude of the father. I think there's no doubt that during the interim, when his son was away, when he was absent from the household, his father had been praying. Now, the fact that that doesn't say that in the scripture, exactly that, doesn't mean that he wasn't doing that, does it? I believe he was praying. Praying for his son, and likely periodically he would go out this way. Maybe he, maybe he lived near a, uh, um, uh, an intersection. Maybe there were, were uh, the traffic went four ways. And he would go out and he would look. And he would look down every way to see if his son, oh, To see if his son might be coming. He just didn't forget about him. He wanted to see the day when his son returned. He wanted him reconciled to the family. God is all about reconciliation. His father of course, represents our Heavenly Father. He wants His creation reconciled to Himself. Notice the circumstances that led to the Son's return. They were adverse circumstances. We get a picture of that in verse 15 and 16. Did I did I give you the 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 I, I don't think I even given you gave you the the uh, uh, location. Uh, this is Luke fifteen eleven to thirty two, where the account of the prodigal son is, and I'm I'm referring to uh, verses fifteen and sixteen of that passage. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his field to feed swine. That was his job. He would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. He would have gladly eaten with the pigs. And no one gave him Anything. No one gave him anything. A job feeding swine was an insult for a Jewish boy. He had stooped about as low as you could go. You see, it was during that time that he came to himself. All the money was gone. All the friends were gone. And the season of the pleasure of sin had passed. He is alone. He is lonely and desperate. So in this desperate state, he declares, I will arise and go to my father. The father's response was, 
My son was dead and is alive again, was lost and now is found. Hallelujah. When someone comes to the Lord, the angels in heaven are rejoicing. We are rejoicing. The one who was dead, spiritually dead, has been found. The one that was lost has now been found. I want to say to you this morning, don't give up on the prodigals. Because God has not given up on them. Let us remember this. Especially you young mothers and fathers. That we instill in our children. What we instill in our children is etched. On their hearts. And the spirit of God is well able to bring it to their to their remembrance. The scriptures, the teachings, what they learned in their youth. The Spirit of God is well able to bring it to their remembrance. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Teach a child to choose the right path. And when he is older, he will remain upon it. I kind of like that translation rather, rather than the one that says he, when he is old. I like the passage that says, when he is older, as he is old, grows older and matures, he will come back to it or remain upon it. Praise the Lord. Seeds were planted in the church on Sunday mornings, in daily devotions, in memorizing scriptures, and in examples that the mother and the father have set in daily living. Hide the word of God in their hearts and do not neglect the family time together, the devotional time. This is building not only for now, but also for eternity. The family altar is important. Let me give you one example, which I may have given you before, but I'll repeat it. Or maybe some, not everybody heard it. Or you forgot it. One morning at family devotions at our home. Bryce is about six years old. Family devotions kind of went along the line of, of the Savior. And saving our souls. And we could give our hearts to the Lord. Irene says, turns to Bryce and says, Bryce, would you like to give your heart to the Lord? And Bryce said, yes. And the Lord led him, and then Irene led him to the Lord right there at the, at the breakfast table. You see, the altar was there that morning. You, uh, don't misunderstand me. The altar here is important, but it's not the only altar. The altar can be any place. Let me, let me just dwell there for a moment. Dear friends of ours, they no longer live here, but we coffeeed with them many times here in, in North Battleford. A Christian couple enjoyed their company, had five children. They had a boy that was not walking with the Lord, and they were praying lots for him. He's in the pub. And then his whole life flashes before him. I expect there was somebody praying for him. His whole life flashes before him. He could see all of the terrible things he was doing. And he started to cry. And he cried for three days. Then he gave his heart to the Lord. And said, I want to be finished with this stuff. The altar... That day was in the beer parlor. 
for that boy. You say, oh, that, that can't happen. Oh, not so sure. I believe this, what this father was telling me. I heard another story one time. This was from a pastor in back home there where we lived for most of our lives. He was giving his testimony. And I happened to be present. He said one time he was not walking with the Lord. His father was a pastor and, and, and he wasn't walking with the Lord. And one time he's in Saskatoon and he's walking down a street late at night. Probably had, had come out of the pub. I don't know where he'd come from. There was a nativity scene that he passed. And he stopped. And he looked at the nativity scene and he knew what it meant. And it touched his heart. And he fell down his knees right on the sidewalk and rededicated his life to the Lord. The altar was a Saskatoon street that night for him. Oh, the Lord is so wonderful. You could tell stories of people or yourself or, you know, God just does what he wants to do. Now, I don't know where I was. Let me just say this. If you get finished before I do, then maybe you'll tell me. <laughs> dedicate them to the Lord. Have your children dedicated to the Lord. In your local church, when they're very young, they don't have to know what's happening. They don't know what's happening. But it's important. They can't get a better start than that. The prayers of dedication by the elders carries with it the blessing of the Lord. I'm sure of it. Those prayers and that blessing will go with them for their entire lives. I remember one time, I hope, uh, I don't know, Mark and Gordon, are you here? Maybe they're not. They wanted their daughter dedicated to the Lord. They were living up at Laurent. And I was an elder at the time. And I said, Irene and I will come. And I remember taking that little girl in my arms. I will never forget it. And the blessing of the Lord just seemed so close and so present to that little one. Oh, never ender, underestimate the Lord and what he's doing in a little life. When things go awry, and they usually do, Stand firm on the blessing. Stand firm on the dedication. Claim them for Christ. Just to bore you a little bit more. After one of, for each one of our grandchildren, I wrote a poem. You know that I do a little of that stuff. And I think I caught the essence of the, of the dedication. In the last verse of, of, of one of these dedications. Today, as you, meaning the parents, today as you present her to the Lord, His sweet spirit on her will be poured. She will be bound by love's strong cord to the family to the church, and to the Lord. God has planned that the home should be a place of security, a place of safety, a place where love and respect are evident on a daily basis, and a place where there is, there is firm but fair discipline. Let us see what the scripture says about these vital attributes of the home in Ephesians, in Ephesians 5, 33, 6, 1 to 4. Nevertheless, 
Let each one of you in particular so love his, his wife uh, as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. How are you supposed to love your, how are you supposed to love your, your wife? As Christ loved the church. Now in this particular scripture, it doesn't say anything about the wife loving her husband. But I'm sure that love is part of that. Respect is part of that. I often said, in all my years in the, in the teaching profession, and here we got some teachers down here, we'll know what I'm talking about, uh, I never cared whether I was loved. But I sure cared, I cared about whether I was respected or not. Because that was, that was the important thing. Without respect, you got nothing. With respect, you got something that's solid. It says, I might go on. <clears throat> Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, you know, sometimes we might think, we, we might, might put emphasis on the obey, obey your parents, and that's important, and not, and not receive the, the second part of it. Which says, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. The Philip says, bring them up with Christian uh, teaching and Christian discipline. Notice a couple of things about this, these scriptures. There's a promise that accompanies honoring your father and your mother. And fathers are to be fair in the discipline of their children. Children have a keen sense of fairness. The Phillips puts it this way. Fathers don't overcorrect your children, or make difficult make it difficult for them to obey the commandment. <clears throat> Just a little bit longer. <clears throat> Hang in there. This passage that I'm going to read to you was taken from a book entitled Intended for Pleasure by Ed and Gay Wheat. I'm going to quote a short passage. The stability that comes when marriage, home, and family are operated according to God's order can become a powerful safety measure, keeping your kingdom at peace. This means that your marriage will not be a patriarchy where husband rules as a dictator. You hear that? Where husband rules as a dictator. Or a matriarchy, where wife rules as the awesome power behind the throne. It will not be an anarchy, where no one has answered the question, who's in charge? Where there are no rules, children usually end up in control. And this is the most destructive government of all. Instead, your marriage will be a theocracy, where God rules, where the husband is the head of the house, where he is responsible to carry out the will of God, where the wife operates under the covering of her husband's love, wisdom, and protection. Hallelujah. Where children obey their parents. This is the order of headship and submission. A beautiful order ordained by God, and if followed, will have his blessing. I earlier explained what that meant. It is not a superior, subordinate relationship. It is not. I'm going to conclude with a few things that I questioned when I was thinking about this, whether I should or not. You may not find scripture and verse for them all. But I've had a pretty vast experience with children. Not only my own, but many, many other people's children. Just going to give you a few short snappers. Insist upon respect. 
The respect that we demonstrate to our spouses will influence our children. Children model what they see. Someone said the best thing that you can do for your, the best thing a father can do for his children is to love their mother. Be cons- number two, be consistent in what is acceptable and what is unacceptable. Don't change it and flip flop. Be consistent. Predictability is important to children. Inconsistency results in confusion and disrespect. Number three, be united in your discipline. Be united in your discipline. For all decisions regarding your children, a dysfunctional home is where father says one thing and mother says another. Disunity results in confusion in the minds of the children. I see a few frowns as I'm talking. I don't know about, uh, what that means. Number four. I think maybe some, some people might say, who's this old guy talking like he knows something? And uh, you can take it for what it's worth. And this fourth one is the catch-all. But I think these are rather important areas that parents need to, to, uh, uh, to <clears throat> wrestle with. Sometimes you wrestle with them. They need to come to agreement on them. They need the illumination of the Spirit on them. They include, but are not limited to, dating, movies, television, the internet, music, dress, parties, sleepovers, and friends. I'm not telling you what to do about all of those things. I'm just saying they're going to cross your path. You can count on it. I remember very very well. My three boys all played hockey. I loved hockey. I played hockey myself. They played hockey. There came to the time when there was a time, you know, they didn't play hockey on Sunday, but that soon changed. When Sunday was the same as every other day. So mother and I sit down. What are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about this? This boy here sits right in front of you, right in front of me here. He loved to play hockey. Am I going to say to him, son, I know it's an important game, but sorry. I couldn't do that. I could not do that. You say, well, you're not much of a father. You think what you want to think. But mother and I came to an agreement on that. And we've talked to them about it today to see how they feel about it today. Because two of them are elders. And you know, at least for our family, I think we made the right decision. Knowing all the time that mother and father would have preferred that they would be in church. That mother and father were always in church, not at the hockey game. We demonstrated what was priority. But you see, for a 10-year-old boy, church is getting in the way of, a, of his hockey game, not the other way around. I don't say that because that's what I want you to do. I just say this because you've got to come to grips with it. It may not be hockey. It can be other many, many, many other things. It can be music. You have to come to grips with it. 
and you need to be united. I suggest to you that many of these things have become far too lax. And part of the reason may be because societal influences and worldliness have crept in, where sin is made to look normal and righteousness is made to look strange. Philip Keller, again, in his book, A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm, and I quote, In our modern era era of mass communication, the danger of the mass mind, all thinking alike. Oh, I'm not talking about the unity of the spirit here. That's a unity where we do think alike. The mass mind is out there. Grows increasingly grave, being molded under the subtle pressures and impacts of television, radio, magazines, newspapers, and classmates. I would add to that list the internet, social media, institutions of learning. And let me qualify that by saying, I have nothing against the internet. I just hate the things that are available on it with the click of the mouse. I'm not against social media either for the right purposes. And I am not against institutions of learning. I've been through them myself. But there are a lot of things there that I will not participate in, that I will not allow to become part of my philosophy because I don't believe it, plain and simple. I'm watching the time. I think I got to 11.30. Uh, and I'll, I'll take most of the time. The last time I would like, the last point I would like to make to you to, to, today is to take time for your children. If there is one thing I regret, it is in allowing everything to get in the way of spending time with my family. As I have grown older, I have tried to correct that tendency. I thank God for their mother who was always there for them. She was the steadfast presence in in their lives during the times when there was an absent father. Now, I wasn't absent because I wanted to be absent. I usually wasn't on the golf course. Now, I won't say I wasn't ever on the golf course. But I usually wasn't on the golf course. I was at a meeting. I was required here. I was, their school activity was going on over here and all, all the milieu of things. But she was there. The constant. So important. Try as best you can to be present at your children's activities and celebrate their achievements in academics, sports, music, art, or whatever their endeavor may may be. Mila plays soccer. One day her friends were saying, you know, Grandma and Grandpa are going to be at my soccer game. She says to her mother, how come Grandma and Grandpa never come to our soccer, my soccer game? So I said, well, I heard that we better get with it. I mean, those grandmas and grandpas of her friends like lived right in Saskatoon. I live in North Battleford. Anyway, Mila, we're at your soccer game, remember? Where you scored a whole bunch of goals. So I got, I got to inject a little bit of humor uh, to wake you up. After the game, I said to her, Mila, Who's the best player on your soccer team? She said, I am. (laughs) There's no problem with ego in our family because she has it all. (laughs) 
Or maybe she got a little bit from her grandpa. (laughs) Praise and encouragement are important to adults. How much more are they essential in the growth and development of children? Praise is important to God. For the scripture says that he inhabits our praises. He thinks praise is important. I think we should too. With each other. I don't mean flattery. I don't mean that. I know the difference. Console them. Console them during their times of discouragement. Their home is a place of acceptance, love, safety, and comfort. It is their ark or refuge and and fortress in times of storm. You see, the enemy is, I see my time now is gone. The enemy is as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He is also an angel of light, seeking whom he may deceive. Children need the protection and the discerning powers of their parents when they are vulnerable to the enemy's tactics. Last sentence. Claim your children for Christ. Claim your grandchildren for Christ. The blood of Jesus covers each one of them. If the lamb that was slain for a household was a covering for Israel, how much greater is the covering that the blood of the Lamb of God provides for us today. If you would like more information about the moving of God's Spirit or resources for your spiritual life, please visit our website at www.globalmissionsinc.org.